Now, I think I said that fairy tales were stories of transition. So I have one last fairy tale for you. Inside you, there is an old king. The old king has had good times, the old king has had bad times. The king is definitely at the end of his reign. Now, the thing that the king loved more than anything now was just standing underneath his apple tree. He loved his apples. He liked to count his apples. It's something that sovereigns always do in stories. Apple four, apple five, and apple six. And one day, as the old man looked at the apples, these rosy red apples, they say a wistfulness came over him because when he was in the presence of the apple tree, he remembered what it was like to be young. And something touched him and he said this out loud to all of the four quarters. This apple tree is mine. And if anyone comes to take an apple from my tree, they shall find themselves a hundred yards under the dark soil. That is my decree. Everybody heard it. Now the king had three daughters. They didn't take this seriously at all. They'd seen their father like this before. And so one day at dusk, they're out underneath the apple tree. And the apples, it's that time, it's the end of the summer, they're succulent, and they're ready to drop. And the youngest of the girls, she said, I think we should have one of the apples. Between us, what could be the harm? Now, the oldest girl, she was known across the land for having the far-seeing intelligence of a hawk. She thought like a hawk thinks. And she said, well, she said, no, the father needs the apple tree because when he is strong and happy, the land itself is in a good state. We shouldn't eat the apple. Now, the apple, the sister in the middle, not the apple, she was known throughout the land as having the warmth heart of a mother bear. And she said, well, look, I don't know about our father's business with keeping the whole kingdom together, but he's just so happy when he's under that tree. He's remembering when he was young and riding the red horse of desire. So no, I don't think we should have an apple either. Leave him to the old man. The third daughter was not known anywhere for having the far-seeing intelligence of a hawk. She wasn't known for having the warmth of a mother bear. She was known for having the impulsiveness of a goat. Meat! And she said, I want the apple! Oh. <laughs> Ring any bells? And she said, oh, good. And she looked up and she said, the sky hasn't fallen on my shoulders. Look, I have a bit of the apple. What could be the harm? And so the other girl had a little bit of the apple. And even old Hawkey herself had a little bit of the apple. And as they gazed around and thought, we think we've got away with it, suddenly the dark grass is opened and they found themselves a hundred yards under the dark soil. A few hours later, Pops is looking for his girls. He comes out to the tree, he's asked the people of the court, he said, have you anybody seen my daughters? And slowly, like a bell ringing in the far distance across the flat fields of Norfolk, he goes, oh, God, oh, God, they've eaten the apple. My prediction has happened. They've disappeared. Now, he can't quite remember whether it was 100 yards under the dark soil or some kind of distant banishment, but he knows they've disappeared. So he sets out word. He will give away the usual terms in most of these stories, half the kingdom and the possible courtship of one of his daughters, if anybody at all can find them. Well, it was an impoverished kingdom. So everybody, every family is scurrying around trying to find the three girls. But at the edges of this kingdom, there was a forest. And the old name of the forest is this. It is the forest you go into and never come out. So no one goes in the forest, <laughs> apart from three hunters. Now, if three women had gone missing, 
you would suspect that that ancient stretches of old woodland would be a place to go. And so these three hunters searched and searched and searched and searched. Now, four or five days into the forest, it's dusk, they're tired, they're thinking, what are they going to eat tonight? Is it going to be a scrawny bit of fox over a poacher's fire? When suddenly they saw the ruins of an old castle, castle covered in ivy. Now this is a little odd because they have passed through this stretch of woodland before and they've never seen the castle. So they sort of check it for booby traps, but they notice that the kitchen is still going. In fact, there is the smell of cooking food. It's an old door, they open the door. What is the sound of that old door, please? <laughs> never gets old, never gets old. And they're in. And there is indeed a plate of every single food you've ever desired in all the different stages of your life. It's all on the table and it's all warm and it's all gorgeous and there's, there's IPAs and there's sparkling water and there's little cafetiere just for afterwards and there's little biscuits and cheese. It's just wonderful. So the three brothers sit down at the table and as they ate, the castle slowly started to reconstitute itself around them. That's what happens when you go hunting in the deep forest. And by the time it was bed, there were three resplendent bedrooms waiting for them. Silk sheets, fires kept in keen excitement. And they said, I like the way this is turning out. <laughs> he goes off here, he goes off here, he goes off here. By the morning, the ruin of this castle is entirely back together again. It's, it's back. So you can imagine these three wild little boys, they're just scarecrows, really. They've never had anything as splendid as a castle. So they say, we know we need to keep looking for the girls, but, you know, we want our digs. You know, as they say, possession is nine-tenths of the law. If we could just stay here, at least one of us, while the other two are hunting, we can keep this castle. So that is what transpired. Now, I think at this point in the story, I think it was the oldest brother. And he is sitting at home. I don't know what. He's flossing. He's just flossing. He's been eating a lot of elk recently. <laughs> he's flossing away. And get, get, get this. Knock at the door. He goes to the door. And peering up at him was a small brown man, completely naked. Now, these days, in such ignorant times, we may call them a dwarf. But in the time, in the true language of this story, this is what you would call an earth god. And the earth god said to him these words. Will you let me in? Can I cross the threshold? Okay. Ooh, is that fresh bread I smell cooking? Baking, I think. And he said, yeah, it is. And he said, I'm, I'm just so hungry. Could I possibly just have a, a little slice of your bread? And the oldest brother said, well, I don't see why this would be a problem. Sure, you, you can have some bread. So he brought a slice of bread to the little earth god. And he handed it to him. And very <coughs> deliberately, the earth god let it fall to the floor. And he said, oh, I appear to have dropped my bread. Would you pick it up for me? And the oldest brother said, well, yeah, I'll pick your bread up. At that moment, the little earth god whipped out an enormous club, smashed it down on the bloke's head and went, idiot, 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 bang, 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 ate the bread, disappeared back into the forest. Who knew? Just don't pick the bread up. Well, being a fairy story, you know this happened again, don't you? You know this whole scene happened to the second brother. So, as time is a flying arrow, the third day came around where there's the third brother. And he's at home, he's on the jogging machine. He's been putting on weight. He's trying to lose it. There he is. Knock, knock, knock at the door. <laughs> Opens the door. 
There's the little brown man. None of the brothers, they're all so ashamed of their beatings, none of them's told them about how it had transpired. They're just wearing big hats to hide the bruises. <laughs> Will you let me in? Can I cross the threshold? Younger brother, fill your boots, come on in. Hey, Mancunian, little Mancunian earth god. Hey, hey, comes in and he says, uh, oh, hey, I can do with a bit of bread. Could I have a bit of bread? Could I have a bit of your bread? And he says, yeah, sure, you can have a bit of bread. Now, he hands the bread to the earth god. The earth god lets it drop to the floor and he goes, I appear to have dropped my bread. Will you pick it up for me? And the third brother said, bread is a matter of life and death. And if you can't carry your bread, do you think I am going to do it for you? And with that, he pulled out an even bigger club and started bashing the little earth god round the head. And the earth god said, wait, 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 I'll tell you where the three girls are. Stories move very swiftly sometimes. <laughs> I'll tell you where the girls are. And he said, good, glad we're talking. Now, please, lead me to the three women. Where are they? And so the earth god took the youngest hunter out, outside, around the back of the castle where there was an old well. Now, there must have been times in your life, maybe when you were a child, where you went past you went past places that were eerie. They were just eerie. This was one of those places. It was the kind of broken down remains of this old well. The top of the well was sort of wet with spider's webs and there was moss all over it and strange gargoyly faces peering out. You don't want to hang around near a well like this. But the earth god came over and he said this, the women you seek are at the bottom of this well in three chambers. He said, right, okay, bottom of the well. And he said, you can get there if you go down in the little bucket to the bottom of the well where they are. He said, well, this is sounding very easy. What could be the problem? <laughs> said the earth god, Here's the rub. Down there in the bowels of the earth, the women have come into the company of dragons. He said, really? He said, yes. Within each chamber, sitting with their great head on the lap of each of these three girls is a dragon. So let's get this clear. There's three women exiled at the bottom of the well with vast dragon heads nestling between their hips. He said, yeah, <laughs> yeah, there is. <laughs> well, what are they doing? Here's a fact for you. Every day, hair pours from the head of a dragon and requires combing and cutting. And the women sit there with a silver comb and silver scissors combing and cutting the hair on the heads of their dragons. Down there in the glittering dark, down there in the chthonic underbelly of you, you are down there combing and cutting the hair of a dragon. Now, says the earth god, there is a time for combing and there is also a time for cutting and they are going to be down there forever if you don't go down and help them do you think you can do it and he said uh, yeah I, I, I think I can as the earth god was leaving he said one last thing your brothers do not have your best interests at heart so maybe forget all of this but you just go down and do it and he said oh okay okay earth god is gone <laughs> brothers come back well naively the young brother immediately brings them to the well and he says, you're not going to believe this, but this little brown man came to the door, this little earth god, I bashed him around the head. He said, what I carry is bread. I said, bread is a matter of life and death. If you can't carry your own, do you expect me to do it before you? Anyway, he told me where the three girls are. They're at the bottom of the, uh, the well in three separate dungeons and there are, there are dragons resting with their heads, coming and cutting. There's a lot of stuff going on. Older brother 
He says, ah, thank you for that. Thank you for that. I shall be the one that goes to the bottom of the well. I shall climb in. And he climbs in to the, it's like John Cleese. <laughs> he climbs into the bucket. <laughs> Just, I've never. Just, <sighs> climbs into the bucket. Now, look, they've had a lot of good eating. A lot of good eating at the castle. So his ass is enormous by this point. It kind of pours over the bucket. Now, the earth god had warned the first brother that the further you get down this well, you are entering difficult, difficult places. So, in the bucket, there was a little bell that you could ring. If it all got a little bit too much, you could ring your bell and you would be quickly winched to the surface. So, older brother says, I shall go down. Let me down. He only got to 15 foot under the soil before the walls seemed to squeeze in. The spider's web started to drip on his face. It felt like crow claws were clutching his skin and diggy, 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 I've changed my fucking mind, let me up, let me up. <laughs> they let him up, splays himself out on the grass. <gasps> the things I've seen, the things I've seen, I could write a workshop about it. There he is. Maybe it's time for the second brother. Is it finally time for the middle brother? Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. It's time for the middle brother. The middle brother in us is squeezing, 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 squeezing into the little bucket. Take me down, take me down. <laughs> down he goes. Now to his eternal credit, 15 foot, 30 foot. He gets 50 foot down before it squeezes and grinds around him until finally, oh, fuck this. Diggy, 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 diggy. Winching him up, winching him up, winching him up, winching him up, splayed out in the long grass with his brother. <laughs> While they're doing that, calmly, you know, filing his nails as he goes, <laughs> breathing deeply, the third younger brother, what we call the runt of the litter, gets in the bucket and he goes down and down and down and down to the very bottom of the well. Now when he gets there, he finds there's no water in it. Maybe there's a few drips here and there, but it's just muddy and it's a deep dark black. It's the kind of darkness your eyes will never get used to. But he can see just a glint of the three doors. And he opens that first door. And sure enough, just as the earth god said, there is a young woman with the head of a dragon resting between her hips with hair slowly curling from his head as she combs and she cuts and she combs and she cuts. He said, should I come back later? It's a, it's a strange scene. Should I stay or go? And she looked at him and said, stay. <laughs> stay. There is a time to comb and there's a time to cut. You know what to do. And with that, he produced his blade and he cut the head off the dragon. Cut it off. But... He did something very important. He took the tongue out of the dragon and stuck it in his bag. Because when you go down into the underworld, you want evidence that you went there. Otherwise, people will think you're a liar. Always have a dragon's tongue in your bag. That is the advice of the evening. <laughs> Goes to the next chamber, same thing takes place. Goes to the third chamber, same thing takes place. It is there is a time to comb and there is a time to cut. Metaphore, metaphore, metaphore. So, the three women are now out. Now, I think in the other story, I talked to you about three strands of silver in the hair. <laughs> They're just white-haired now. They're just friggin' white-haired. They have the knowledge of the dragons. They get in the pot, the bucket, I think is the phrase, and up they go, one after the other. Now, imagine... If you were the older two brothers and they've had their little freak out in the grass and now they're pulling the bucket up 
expecting to see the little runt. But what did they see coming out of the ground but these three astonishing women, one after another after another. There is a reason in fairy tales why brothers like this are often called the false brothers. Because once the women were up, out came the blades. He'd been climbing up in the bucket and they cut the rope. It was a long time in that darkness your eyes never really get used to. With just the dust of the rope on your face, far from the world of chattering and of lights and of ambition. Now what happened up there was blades at the throats of the young women. You shall say nothing of what has transpired in the underworld. You shall not speak of our brother that saved you. You shall not speak of the tongue of the dragon. We are your saviors. And if you disagree with this, we'll come find you. Am I making myself absolutely clear? And they said, yes, yes you are. So the two hunters and the three women went back to the king. But down, down at the bottom of the well, he has entered the slow time of his life, that third brother. Now if a story tells you he spent four weeks at the bottom of a well, man, that could be four years in our lifetime. If we're truly unlucky, it could be four decades, trapped in Croydon. <laughs> Nothing wrong with Croydon, that was wrong of me. But you know what, you know where I'm going. You know where I'm going. Now, while he was down at the bottom of the well, they say in the place where his eyes never got used to it, his beard grew in strange constellations. His hair became matted and hung down his back. His skin was lupine pale. They say he got more used to traveling on all fours than standing up. Round and round and round the bottom of the well he goes. They say what had once been mud ridged became absolutely smooth with his paw tracks. Round and round. And one day, in the dark, he suddenly felt something in his hand he'd never felt before. It was a musical instrument. He picked it up. He could just see the glitter of a flute. He almost brought it to his lips and he said this. Now is not the time for music. He put it back. You and I, we'd be playing on that flute. Now is not the time for music. He put it back into the darkness and carried on padding half wild round the cave. His belly is stuck to his spine. His soul is preparing to leave his body like blue smoke. And it was only then, when he was face to face with the duende of his own death, only then, that his hand <coughs> moved out and touched the flute. He took the flute to him. He played one note on it. And the moment he played the flute. Bang! In the darkness, standing in front of him, was a little earth god. <laughs> he said, you could have played the flute earlier, you know. <laughs> Keep playing. So in the dark, 
playing the strange, unwieldy rhythms from the bottom of the well, note after note after note, pause from the flute, and every time a note is struck, appears another, 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 another little man. A little earth god. It's like a, a congregation of them. It's like the Piccadilly Circus of the earth gods. <laughs> you can't move for them down there until finally they are standing in front of this strange lupine being and they say, what do you need? And he says, I'm clear. You need to get... <laughs> You really need to get me out of the well. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> they said, why didn't you say? Each one of them, each one of them took a curl on his head and slowly started to lift him. This is, like, again, this is a cave painting. This is a cave painting. They started to lift him. And I have it on good authority, it was not painful in case you're wondering. <laughs> I have it on good authority that Zephyr, that coaxing wind of the Greeks, just caught him underneath and gently wafted him aloft, as my grandmother used to say, <laughs> moving up through the dark, these strange glowing beings holding on to each curl on his head until they positioned him at the top of the well. Anything else at all? And he said, no, just get me to the king. And with that, he set off. Now, I think I have given you a reasonable description of his appearance. He was not going to be appearing on the X Factor anytime soon. He looked wild from top to bottom, east to west. So, when he appeared at court, when he suddenly burst in on the scene, when the three daughters beheld him sitting with the king, the king looked at him and said, have him clapped in irons. Now, this is a tricky moment for the three young women because they had sworn, truly, they would say nothing of the truth of the situation to the king. But you don't get to hang down in the depths with dragons without learning a little bit of cunning. So they said this, Father, there's nothing we can tell you about the wild man that has just turned up at court, other than he does have something to do with our story, but were you to stand in the hinge between one door and another, you may hear something interesting because we want to tell a story to the fire. And some say this is the beginning of the tradition of storytellers in the hearth fire. So the three sisters went to the fire and between them, they started to weave and weft the story of everything that had transpired since their father had sent them into exile. Some say the one known for the impulsiveness of the goat spoke with the far-sightedness of the hawk. Some say the one that spoke with the warmth of the mother bear spoke with the impulsiveness of the goat. And before you knew it, the story was ricocheting, pirouetting, between the three, and standing in the hinge place, the place of all storytellers, Hermes, god of the storytellers, stands in this place. The king heard the story and he said these words, indeed, indeed, indeed. Bring me the two hunters. And the hunters were brought forward they brought the wild man from the cellar and he said, is there any way that you could prove you are the one that went to the bottom of the well? And with this, he produced not one, not two, but three dragon tongues from his bag. And the king cocked his head at the other two hunters 
and they were sent down to the dungeon and as far as I know, they are in there, rotting to this day. Now what storyteller would I be if I was to tell you that there was not a grand wedding between the eldest of the sisters and the youngest of the brothers? You have the keen-eyed intelligence of the hawk marrying a boy from the wild forest. And in time, they did indeed become the king and queen of that place. And for many years, there was a royal road, a road de la Rosa, between the center and the wild, the forest and the village, the pastoral and the prophetic a time to comb, and a time to cut, and a time to comb, and a time to cut. And their children were the ones that told the stories. And some say that the three women would travel with their dragon tails, and the husband would tra travel with them, playing his strange music from the bottom of the well. And I think their relatives are in the room tonight. So I say blessings on the head of this old teaching tale. And I say blessings on the head of you for having the tenacity to stick this out so late in the evening. And I say to you, may you be half an hour in heaven before the devil knows you're dead. But I also say this, only you know what happens next. And what are you going to do with this? What are you going to do with this? What are you going to do with this? Because here's the thing that you didn't expect to happen. Don't come to me looking for honey if you are not about to become a bee. Within the next seven days, please pass this story on. Just as you heard it, or half heard it in this room. Because it has something to say to you I know nothing about. That's how it was, that's how it happened, and that is all I know. Thank you very much and good night.